our final respondent is Elizabeth, and I don't want to mess up your last, someone else with a very complicated last name. Um, I, can it's, you say it? It? You just pretend it doesn't have the E. So oh, actually, like you pretend there's a W in that last name. It's an email thing, but yeah, so you just pretend okay. it doesn't have yeah. Okay, so Cohen Burbage. Um, since 2016, Dr. Elizabeth Cohen Burbage has taught modern world United States history and diversity studies at the Woodward Academy, an independent school in College Park, Georgia, where she is also a club advisor for the WA Eagle Exchange, the school's podcast club, and intersectional feminism. Elizabeth is also the producer and a contributor for the podcast Footnoting History, um, a very popular podcast actually that boasts uh, 3 million downloads and over 500 or 5,000 subscribers. Um, Elizabeth ended her doctorate in medieval earned her just uh, ended earned her doctorate in medieval history from Fordham University in 2016, and her work has been published in medieval Parsography and Nursing Clio. Um, she's the editor of Independent Scholars Meet World, a collection of essays on independent scholarship that was published by the University Press of Kansas in the fall of 2020. Um, and I will pass the. All right. Um, thank you, Courtney, and thank you, everyone. It is indeed a pleasure to be here. It was almost like it was, a, as I said to um, Charles at the beginning, it was a, it was an eleventh hour reprieve, but we're here. Um, and like Ashley, I want to start with an anecdote, which ties in well for anyone who ever will get to know me or, or does know me. Courtney and I actually met on social media on Twitter, um, and so this is a story, but this is from Facebook that I am in two different Facebook groups for social studies teachers, and they each have over 5,000 members. And recently, a new um, or a would-be teacher was asking, what do I do if at my interview tomorrow someone asks me if I teach critical race theory? And a lot of people responded, just tell them you teach the state standards. And I was like, well, okay, you teach the state standards, but there's allegedly a lot of wiggle room in the state standards, and I teach at a private school, so I am not beholden to the state standards, though I teach AP US history, so I kind of am beholden to some standards. But it was a large conversation, and building on that, I'm part of the Medieval Academy of America's K-12 through committee, and at our meeting this past spring, I presented at a roundtable with uh, Chris Hitchcock. So if anyone else is on Twitter and you follow hashtag SS chat, which is the social studies chat, she leads that. And so that's a very, so if you are a, a history teacher or a social studies um, educator and you're interested in seeing what happens in K through 12, or at least on the Twitter, I would follow with that. And we had some really great papers and we were listening and it was very similar to tonight where people, university professors had excellent ideas on what we could include in the classroom and how we could shape things and how we could shift them. But the question Chris kept having and that I realized was really important is, but is it in the standards? Because do we have time to teach it? And if we, it's not just, and so that's what Ashley was saying, not just for her, but for her department. And so not for us, but for those 5,000, 10,000 people in the social studies Facebook groups, they're gonna need a bit more to feel even comfortable addressing it. And so what I'm gonna ask, um, am I frozen? No, I'm okay. Okay, what I'm gonna ask from you, the same way that Ashley just asked, so Ashley actually took my other ask, which was we need turnkey lesson plans. Thank you, Ashley. My ask is I want you all to become activists and contact your state board of eds and talk to them about your social study standards because we're not gonna change anything on the ground until those get changed. And that's actually kind of what I'm going to show today because as I was reading each article, the same way Ashley was like, how can I use this in the classroom? I was like, can I find this in the standard so I can convince other teachers that they can teach it? And so I wanna show you, I, I'm in Georgia and I have emailed um, our state board of ed, I did it back in May, and then I've done it since we handed out our statement that we will be not teaching critical race theory here, which by the way, is another thing that a lot of teachers are scared. People are really scared about what it means and what's going to happen. So I'm going to share my screen. Let's see, where. what, what was the last thing I had behind this? Oh good, I had my, enter my iCloud. Cool, cool, oh good, okay. So for me, as I was reading, this is what I was thinking of. So elephant in the room, state standards. 
I started, um, so I put them in the order as we were going so that I could kind of go with it. So Anna Peterson's, I love the role of hospitals. I love the idea of medical history. I have tried to convince uh, my department chair that we could start a senior elective that is about medical history. Um, one of my friends works on it also with lepers. So actually, I don't know Anna, if you know Lucy Barnhouse, but this is what she does too. And so I love it. This is the European medieval history standard for Georgia. This is the only thing that covers European middle medieval history in Georgia. So if we're going to get that exact, so, and I put in that it's one standard out of 22 and an average year is about 35 to 36 weeks, which means that each standard takes about a week to cover. And the only place that I could kind of figure out that we could even put this really awesome resource was on maybe like the role of the church in medieval society. We could do this. And it's not that it shouldn't be done because I think it should be done, especially when it talks, um, when Anna talked about really how to care for like postpartum women and what did pregnant women want. That's a really big question. Georgia has one of the highest maternal death rates. I could easily see reading this and tying it to modern events in a discussion with the class, right? Where people are just open-ended questions, discussing things, how does this relate? That could easily be achieved but A, in addition to the turnkey lesson plans, but also a lot of people are gonna say it's not in the standards. So it's not, again, and I think I'm gonna keep reiterating this, it's not really that like Ashley and I need to be convinced to use this, it's that we need to be able to convince the state legislatures that we can incorporate. So then I did Sojourner Truth, and so she doesn't appear as herself, which is fine. We actually took out most people, well, you can see Henry Clay's right here. But I thought that you could probably get to Sojourner Truth in the U.S. History Standard for Georgia, which is 23 standards, where they talk about women's efforts to gain suffrage and the rise of um, abolitionism. Now, we do also have skills based where you're supposed to compare primary sources. And again, like I'm just going to copy everything Ashley said. Like Ashley, I loved that Kelly gave us that side by side comparison. That was so awesome. That can so easily be used. I thought that was great. I just want to point out, though, for example, out of 23 U.S. history standards, abolition is only used here once. So this and this is one page of one standard, which again means that a lot of teachers aren't going to spend the time on it necessarily. It's not that it shouldn't have the time spent on it, but they're going to um, put put other things in front of it. I know there's an exact word for that. Can't think of it. Um, and then uh, Michael's paper about Native American history. So one thing that I did, I teach um, a capstone course for our seniors, that's our diversity studies course. And I break it down by category. We go through US history and that's what we work on. And one of the books, so just if we're talking about resources, one book is, um, hold on, I have it in my notes. I am scrolling, I found it. Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz's An Indigenous People's History of the United States which is very, um, it's in the same vein as Howard Zinn's A People's History, but it's an indigenous people's history. And what I really appreciate about this is A, this is a new series by Beacon Press where they um, revision or they reimagine US history through these different areas. So it's also like the queer history of the United States, um, a black woman's history of the United States. There's a disability history of the United States. And what they've been able to do with some of these books is similar to stamped from the beginning they've made the ya version so there's the ya version of a people's history um of a people's history of the indigenous uh or indigenous history of the people's united states there is a way to say that but so and then you can actually the same way ashley was saying that we have kids at various learning levels even so my school is an independent school and i teach 10th grade but i teach kids who have reading levels of seventh through 12th grade and 10th grade. And so I can photocopy a few pages from this. And what I also appreciate about indigenous people's history is that it starts by explaining settler, settler colonialism from the British point of view with the Irish. And then it brings it to the United States. And that's a really easy way to get white people, especially Irish white people to pay attention. And I know that we shouldn't have to make white people like the center for them to care, 
but we're still kind of at that point and especially when we're dealing with adolescents there's still kind of that mindset but so that book has it's really helpful and so i really agree with michael and i was actually thinking with michael's article you could probably use excerpts from his article and the one that he referenced right and you could go back and forth i'm sure that there's the national review that's usually for the 1619 project we also talk about reactions to the 1619 project so kids will read something from the national review and the cato center but also from the atlantic and all of this to understand what everyone is talking about but for this one i just wanted to point out that the way that the georgia history standards are written so here's native american history part one we want to talk about relations with american indians relations with American Indians, relations with American Indians. We want to talk about the Indian Removal Act. And finally, when Native Americans do become center stage in this story, it's about how the westward expansion impacted the Plains Indians and fulfilled manifest destiny. And so B is evaluate Wait till we get to C. So I just saw Michael cover his face. Wait till we get to C because it makes me so angry. B, evaluate how the growth of the Western population, innovations in farming and ranching impacted Plains Indians. Here's C, explain the Plains Indians' resistance to Western expansion in the United States and the consequences of their resistance. It is written in such a way that they are, it's their own fault. If they hadn't resisted, it's like the whole, you know, well, if you hadn't resisted, he wouldn't have had to hit you. Like that's how our state standards are written, which is why I'm saying that we have to actually start at that high level. It's not that the teachers are not doing their jobs. The teachers are doing their jobs. The teachers need help from people like you, right? Historians with training, with background to stand up in the middle of the state and say, we should probably reconsider how we cover this. And I think that's what, when I was reading these, I just kept thinking that of myself, like of these conversations we keep having in these social studies groups, that the people on the ground are trying to do their job and their job means the state standards. But the state standards are often and written in such a way that this is how you do them. And so these really awesome things that we see have to be shoehorned in because there's not a lot of space for them. And so I think that's where um, I'm going to ask, as I've already said, I'm asking all of us to become activists, um, to reach out to your boards of education and check out your state standards and see what they look like. Find out when the standards are going to be up for revising. Ours were revised only about four or five years ago. I was told that they were totally fine in May. I was told they were totally fine but also that we had other things um, that teachers could use. I was given a whole email of other things related to race in Georgia that teachers could use if they wanted to be more inclusive with their education, which I did ask in my June email to the same exact people if that meant, if the letter about critical race theory they had put out meant that all of those additional resources were no longer allowed, because I don't know. Um, but I thought these papers were great. I am totally going to try and incorporate. I know I'm going to incorporate Sojourner Truth. I, I know I'm going to be able to incorporate um, the medical hospitals, especially with the discussion of women. That one in my world history class, I'm going to be able to use as a think piece article excerpts from Michaels and have them also um, do a comparison with say a Cato Institute or a National Review. I might not go for the Spectre one, but I might go with something, although if it's one of those where I ask them, you know, secondary source reading, here's the initial paper, here's this, here's what we've learned. Where do we fall? What do we think? I might do that. But again, building on Ashley, we need turnkey lesson plans and post that we need the standards changed. Like yesterday. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, so we've got uh, about 15 or so minutes left. Um, I'd love to open the floor for any questions or comments from any of the um, rest of the room um, and go from there. If you can just use, you can either just turn your mic on and start talking or use the hand raise, whatever works easiest for you.
I just want to say that one of the things that I found interesting listening to the papers was this idea of, um, it just felt like a competing idea of like myths and misinformation versus missing information. And I feel like it was really interesting to look at not necessarily just like the wrong things, the wrong things, quote unquote, being taught, you know, this idea of, I mean, I'm a medievalist also, but this idea of like teaching the dark ages as backwards, right. that's a myth that's been perpetuated, but there's also missing information, um, which I think is all the combination of teaching of myths versus not having that updated, um, accurate information available is also something that I thought that each of the three papers had at really um, in different ways, but in really interesting ways about how do we, um, what's out there, what knowledge is available, but also how do we bring that forward? How do we bridge that gap between, you know, what's going on up in the ivory tower of um, academia versus how do we bridge that gap down to um, students that are going to be, you know, essentially joining universities at some point. And I noticed that a lot with my students um, in intro level medieval history courses is that a lot of them have never worked with a primary source before. Um, I do, I teach uh, freshman history courses, very primary source heavy, putting stuff up on the screen, asking them what they think about it, what do they see? Um, and the good majority of them have never been asked to do something like that before. This idea that they can have their own thoughts and opinions about a source. Um, and uh, yeah, so just making those sources available, I think, is a really interesting, um, how do we make, even just make sources available that we, as academics in the university setting, have, like, easier access to, in a way, than um, outside of the academy, I guess. So. I feel like I talked over somebody, somebody else had a... I, I was going to say something, I don't know if I was the person, um, but um, Michael, so, he hello, I'm Lauren Bradshaw. I actually am a university professor in um, University of North Georgia. I teach social studies education. Um, and right now I'm actually teaching elementary social studies education of which I have eight weeks to teach them all the pedagogy and social studies content that they will need to teach K through five education. Mm -hmm. And it is virtual. Um, <clears throat> So just put it all there. I worked very hard on this course for the past four years and revised it three times. Um, and I've actually gotten it to a pretty good place. And I was listening, we're, we're talking about, I mean, K through five education in Georgia is all American history um, and heroification, um, basically. So my students have been investigating Pocahontas and, um, I, I continually have to remind them to not portray all American Indians as um, the innocent. They never say savage. That's that's not something that's ever portrayed. But you were saying that you really hadn't seen examples of that, of where it came from. And um, I would love to know some more historical, like the historical, um, well, the history of that uh, myth. And I was wondering about how much it could be connected to sort of the Disneyfication of Pocahontas and things like that. Um, so that's a question. And then there's another, I had another comment for Elizabeth. Hello, my fellow Peach. Um, I'm in Cobb County. I taught in city schools of Decatur as well as DeKalb County for 10 years middle school. And as someone who knows how to wiggle around those standards real well, I think the power is really going to be in the teacher and the administration as to much what they teach. Um, I also am a consultant for the DOE, um, and I can tell you right now that your Georgia Department of Education uh, social studies people are under a lot of pressure to make a lot of people happy. So that's going to be probably the best answer you're going to get right now <laughs> from yeah. them. I mean, it's, a, it's a lot of pressure to make a lot of people happy. To where they can't even send book recommendations anymore. But Michael, I just still have that question for you. Hey, um, <laughs> so that's, I guess, so Disney's Pocahontas as a piece, like a, of when it, the indigenous take on Pocahontas in itself is probably a dissertation and a half that you could write in and of itself. Because there's the key, there even in the indigenous community, the, there's the there's the stuff about like, hey, maybe we shouldn't have a bunch of weird nature spirit stuff and like comical animals and this stuff. And then there's the other half where that, you know, I believe it was the, I, I forget his name, but the man who voiced um, Powhatan 
I believe, in the film was also a major, um, like a figure in, I believe, with the American Indian movement and stuff like that. So there's, there's this complexity in Pocahontas itself, as problematic as it is, you know. Um, so, of course, students, I mean, probably more so in, you know, what was my generation than now, because I'd probably bet that, you know, those that I went to school with probably saw Pocahontas more than Gen Z do now. I don't know how much further back uh, into the catalog most kids nowadays go. I'm trying to think of the best way to answer your initial question. So, can you do me a favor and <laughs> repeat the? I think I got lost in the. So, are you are you looking to oh, figure out how do we how do we deal with that sort of nature spirit? No, not not possible? exactly. Or, um, Mike, you were talking about how the incorrect portrayal of American Indians, so the savage versus the noble, and I really am very curious about the history of where the no the noble okay. noble savage comes from um, more so because my students just see them as poor innocent people who were mm -hmm. slaughtered and never did anything to anybody besides you know offer them corn and fish when they arrived um, so, and didn't stick up for themselves. I never fought back or anything. Yeah. Um, um, well, the, the I do not have enough time to break it to the Noble Savage aspect. That's an entire, but I will say this, um, sort of working more so in regards to the standards that you might have to work through um, in your state is find elements of indigenous resistance that also conveniently fit into the sort of heroification that you sort of have to teach. Uh, I would go with particularly the Oneida and the American Revolution. Like say, look, these were indigenous people. They were not helpless. They were not, you know, what, what, they made up the one of the largest um, alliances of indigenous people on the eastern seaboard in the Iroquois. And not only did they make the decision to break from that alliance to support the colonies, but they were one of the key allies in the revolution. So you could still frame that. Uh, so, so what I'm saying is you could defeat that sort of innocent. There's other ways to do it, but I'm trying to fit it into the sort of the, the, the way you could turn to your administrator and say, see, that's what I mean. Say, look, the, these were not reactionary people. These were people that took their own agency uh, uh, in and of themselves, um, you know, and made the decision to literally break an alliance with other indigenous people who they'd been with for centuries to support the colonies. Also, Elizabeth uh, put in the chat uh, other examples. I don't know if these would necessarily get into um, the standards, but the Pueblo Revolt, uh, this, which was a highly organized, uh, movement by Ple uh, the Pueblo Indians, particularly in New Mexico, against uh, Spanish uh, imperial occupation, uh, where there were a lot of, you know, this is a whole bunch, of, they literally drove the Spanish out of the American Southwest. King Philip War, which is this massive, oh God, this King Philip War is a cluster in and of itself. Um, you know, the Pequot War, in which you have, again, similar to King Philip's War, these sort of Massachusetts colony sort of stuff. And that there's a lot of stuff that you can show um, their agency. It's just the problem is a lot of it's not going to work with a lot of the, as Elizabeth said in her talk, the state, the state standards in certain areas. You're like, you're not going to be able to say, well, you might be able to get the Traratios into the wire, but I doubt you're going to be able to bring up the Pequot War where, you know, Massachusetts colonists massacred the Pequots and their own, by after setting their own village on fire, that might not make it away and make its way into the K-12 standards. But I'm pretty, I, hopefully the Oneida stuff can. So you can at least sort of get part of that under the wire. I think I said under the wire like four times. There is an answer in there somewhere, I hope. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, Elizabeth, you're talking, but you're muted. <laughs> to Lauren that I actually live in city of Decatur and my kids are in the city of Decatur public schools and our um, superintendent did send a letter to the state board of ed after um, the CRT statement came out saying basically we will not be following that um, 
because that's just not how we do things. So I totally get that there's wiggle room, but I know a lot of people are not going to do the wiggle room. And while I understand they're trying to make everybody happy, there's no way to make everybody happy. And U.S. history tells us that if they continue to try to make everybody happy, they're only going to make the white supremacists happy. So to heck with, yeah, like I understand they're under a lot of pressure, but a lot of people are under a lot of pressure. We're all under a lot of pressure. So I don't know. I feel like in 2021, after the year that we've had, after the century we've had, after the 500 years that we've had, this the boards of ed can deal with some pressure from people who want a realistic portrayal of U.S. history. Also, I put in a bunch of things that are on the AP exam for the college board. So even though they're not on the state standards, you can totally wiggle them in that way, or they're not directly on the state standards, but as you said, wiggle room. And so all of those things, the Seminole Wars where they fight back, um, lots of good things. Obviously, everybody, the most famous example of Native Americans fighting back is, um, oh, it's not Wounded Knee, it's the one right before Wounded Knee, because Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee is the really sad one. Um, it's the one with Custer. Custer's Last Stand is the most famous where they fight back and totally massacre the U.S. soldiers, right? So, I mean, we do have these examples in our history. We just have to find them. All right, I will be quiet now. Um, I think we can, if there are two skinny questions, Ashley and then Anna, and then we'll be done. Um, so I just, it's not a question. It was just more a comment on this um, on this conversation that's going on. Because while I agree with Elizabeth that yes, a lot of it is standards and things like that. Um, what I think a big misconception in education is understanding that it's also very school controlled. And so like, for example, I'm dealing with all of these parents who don't want me to teach certain things, but our department head for the county is therefore rewriting our standards so, to back us up, right? And that's my fortunate um, situation. There are other, examples, other schools where that's not happening and the teacher's just getting thrown under the bus. Um, and so I think it's a combination of standards, but it's also local leadership. Um, and then within the school district itself, because the school district administrators are then subject to school boards um, and things like that. And I mean, unfortunately, Virginia school board meeting just made the world news um, with critical race theory and transgender rights. And you can see what's going on in Virginia. It's fun times. Um, and so I think it's, it's a bigger conversation and I think it's just such a big misconception of the restraints that we're put under as educators with what we actually want to do. And so not, so again, be activists and try to help change the narrative too, um, of, of what the purpose of education is. Awesome. Go ahead, Anna. Uh Thanks. Um, so I just really wanted to thank um, Ashley and Elizabeth for their responses. Uh, I'm truly probably more divorced than the the um, kind of academics that are in the United States since I've been <laughs> removed from the U.S. educational system for um, longer than I really want to admit. And um, looking at the standards that Elizabeth was laying out was I mean, honestly, extremely grim for me as a medieval historian because um, it, it's a period that's incredibly important and there's, and I know you can't teach everything, but just in terms of looking at our movement, even within our field towards global middle ages, absolutely none of that is reflected in what you're talking about. Um, and it is still perpetuating a lot of myths that we'd like to break down. You know, feudalism, I don't even want to touch that iceberg, but we've had a lot of revision and how we look at and understand feudalism. That is something that we can easily communicate to students. But I think kind of our purpose here is if you are being restricted by these, you know, these standards and you don't have the fortunate um, department heads like, you know, helping you to and supporting you, um, I think there is still a way that we can make our research or even help you provide you with like primary sources that will fit in with the arguably limited scope that you have been given. And um, I think I speak for a lot of medievalists and even people, I mean, I'm not going to speak for everyone, but um, that we would be happy to work alongside you to find the resources that you can use. And as you said, using things to talk 
to just relate to like modern issues that are specific to your region or to your state or even just to the United States in general um, to make to build those parallels to kind of bring the past into the present. Um, and, you know, the, th the questions about critical race theory even pop up in the Middle Ages to the degree that, I mean, I showed a still from um, Outlaw King. Look, not a great movie for some reasons, but one of the great things was is there were Black people in it because there were, there were people of color in the Middle Ages. And um, it's sad that we get so excited when we see that, but that kind of representation is important because it's also being, it's on Netflix, it's in the mainstream and things like that. And just using those kinds of images, even if, you know, obviously they're not historical, it does help kind of bring together the fact that the world was a diverse place you know, even in a time where you're not teaching kind of that diversity. So, um, yes. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. It's been truly enlightening for me. Um, yes, if I can help in any way, I'd be more than happy to. Thank you. Drop my email address in the chat box. If anybody has any interest in talking to any of our panelists, just to be a point person so that, you know, there's not everybody dropping their email. Um, please feel free to message me, send me an email, and I can give you the contact information of the um, one of the historians on the panel that was speaking to get more, um, to get some of their resources or those sorts of things. I'd love to be able to uh, open up that dialogue for everyone. And just, again, thank you to uh, the SSEC for allowing a bunch of historians to kind of uh, come in and take over for a little bit and try and figure out a way to open that dialogue.